Applications opened about five hours ago, and we'll talk more about who can apply and how many businesses may be interested in that very soon. Also on the go today, Ontario is expected to give us a better picture, a clearer picture at around 1.30 Eastern of its plans to reopen the economy. Um, gradually, as we know, we've seen it happen in a couple of other provinces. Ontario Premier Doug Ford is proposing what he calls a balanced framework for doing that. Of course, on the weekend, Ontario said that schools would remain closed until May 29th. And if the thought of reopening anything or any of this makes you feel stressed or anxious, you are certainly not alone. There is a new Angus Reid survey this morning that suggests the majority of us think it's, quote, too soon for things to get back to anything approaching normal. And at least half of survey respondents say that their mental health is worsening as the pandemic and shutdowns drag on. So we're going to talk to a psychologist about that important part of all of this as well. As they do, my colleagues, the CBC's David Cochran and the host of Power and Politics, Vashi Capellas, are both here. Um, so uh, let, let's start, I guess, with what the government's going to do today. It's, it's nothing new, but it is the official red tape cutting, I guess, of, of this process, which opened at, uh, I believe, 6 a.m. this morning, Vashi. Yeah, I think that's the perfect way to, to put it. It's almost like they're cutting the ribbon to begin the the opening, I guess, or the, the formal part of this big, big financial aid program. I would say it's one of two marquee pieces of financial aid from the government. The first, of course, was the CERB, uh, $2,000 for individuals who had to stay home or who lost their job because of COVID-19. There were many questions in the lead up to that launch about the technical capacity of the sort of infrastructure of the government to deliver that money Money as quickly as it was needed and though there are still a lot of questions about who maybe may have been left out of the process those people who did apply did end up getting their money very quickly and so now we fast forward to today this program which is aimed at helping businesses of all sizes it's a 75 percent wage subsidy for three months retroactive I believe till March 15th we know of companies with four employees and 4,000 employees like the airlines for example who plan to take advantage of it last week you could go on the CRA's website and use sort of an online calculator to figure out how much you're eligible for. This week, you'll actually be able to go and apply. Now, the government says on that sort of technical capacity issue that you will, 90% of those who apply starting today will be able to get their money, uh, the first sort of increment of it, in within a week. So some at some point at the beginning of May. So the big question, of course, like it was with the CERB, is will the delivery of that actually happen? Will mm -hmm. the technical capacity be there? It, it was for the CERB, as I said but uh, you know many businesses very much counting on it working this time as quickly for them too they have had to wait a lot longer than the CERB this was announced not too long after uh, that program it did have to go through a legislative uh, process and the, the sort of ability to deliver on it the, that technical stuff is a bit more complicated than the CERB because of course it does involve businesses and it does involve meeting mm -hmm. a bit of a higher threshold than the CERB did so uh, we'll have our eye on that certainly I think the numbers will be really indicative of a lot too we have constantly heard from businesses and we know that as we look towards the plans to reopen the economy businesses have been hit so hard and those who own them hit so hard so I think they're watching very closely today and, and over this week to see how quickly that money can come but many of them have have told us that they will make they will take advantage of it uh, and that they do expect it to help them keep employees on the the other side of it of course is those fixed costs which the government made some announcements about last week yeah uh, 73 billion dollars is what they expect that this program will cost David um, and it, it when we think about where it started and where it's ended up it's quite it's quite astounding when the first attempt of this out of the gate was a 10 percent wage surplus bumped all the way up to 75 percent and I was reading some some interesting articles this morning about some bigger companies uh, who want to use this um, but their employees actually make pretty high wages mm -hmm. so the 75 percent doesn't actually cover uh, all of the wages and those companies companies will have to contribute more in order to keep the employees on. So the fact that it now applies to so many size of businesses is sort of interesting too because that presents different challenges as well. Yeah, it's 75 percent of the first $58,700, a number that was picked because that's the maximum uh, a cap level for contributions to the Canada Pension Plan. So they needed to put a cutoff in place somewhere. And this is going to help uh, people who are, who are employed or earn less than that. It's not going to keep everybody whole who makes certainly above that yeah. uh, or even at that amount because some businesses are not going to be able to just simply can't afford to do the 25 percent top up. They don't have any money coming in. And so this is a, a better than nothing type approach, uh, not, not to dismiss it. I don't 
don't mean to say no, it's better no. than nothing, yeah. but for it, it, it's not perfect because uh, no system that you're going to come up with was going to be perfect and was going to keep people whole. But you're right, this is a substantial move uh, from the initial 10% wage subsidy for three months uh, just for small and medium-sized enterprises at that point in time. It's now 75% for everybody. I mean, Air Canada is using this, mm -hmm. and under no circumstance is that a small or medium-sized enterprise. Um, so we've heard from the Canadian Federation of Independent Business that says that about half of its members, uh, this is a survey, not a scientific poll, so it, it doesn't capture the full thing, but it gives you, it's indicative, about half of its members will apply for this, so it does say it's a bit too late for those who've some who've already laid off employees and, and closed shop uh, simply because of the uncertainty. And this has been one of the criticisms of this that has been a, perhaps a little bit too restrictive in its early form. It took a while to evolve and it's been a little bit too slow to get out. Uh, we'll see if, if that's the case when it's all over. Uh, but going back to something Vashi referenced about the CERB, We'll see, again, what the Canada Revenue Agency can do. Uh, they delivered big time on the mm -hmm. CERB in terms of the technical capacity and the processing at enormous volumes, uh, given the size and scale of the economic impact of this pandemic. The difference here and the challenge here is that this is not a one-size-fits-all universal program like the CERB. Every single business will get a different dollar amount. And uh, so there's a little bit more front-end processing than there was with the CERB, which could put some stress and strain into the system uh, based on just how prepared a business is, how complete their information is, and how overwhelmed uh, the processors are. Mm -hmm. in terms of dealing with this. So that's going to be the big challenge. We'll see yet again what the Canada Revenue Agency is made of in terms of delivering this program, how effective the government has been in backstopping them with staff from other departments that have seen a plummet in their operations because of the pandemic. But you know, they delivered on CERB, mm -hmm. so uh, here's hoping they can deliver on the wage subsidy. Yeah, and I should say that uh, the numbers as of April 23rd, there were a total of more than 7 million Canadians applied for that emergency relief benefit, a total dollar value of $22.4 billion. And and you do have to renew for that benefit every month. So the government's hope is that some of the people, some of the companies that may be furloughed workers will now bring them back using the wage subsidy and the Canadians that applied for the CERB won't need to do it for all the months going forward necessarily. Um, that is the Prime Minister's house. You're familiar with it, Rideau Cottage. He'll uh, emerge in about uh, eight minutes time or so to speak with us uh, more about the wage subsidy. But while we await him, I did want to talk about another sort of side effect if you will, of, of the pandemic. And that is in terms of how you're all doing, how Canadians are doing during all of this. There are some numbers just released from an Angus Reid survey today that say one out of two, so 50% of you, believe your mental health is worsening. 10% say it's worsened a lot since the crisis began, really deteriorating. Um, and the survey found that deteriorating emotional well-being is really common across all age groups for both men and women. The poll also shows one in five Canadians are being hardest hit, struggling with their mental wellness while also struggling to make ends meet. And as you saw there, Alberta has the highest proportion of people struggling with all that. Those numbers are probably no surprise to psychologist Dana Lee Bagley, and she says her patients pretty much only want to talk about the pandemic's impact on their lives. And Dana Lee Bagley joins us now from Halifax. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. I, uh, I mean, I think everyone has some level of struggle with this, right? Whether it's um, the emotional problems because you're stuck at home and you feel cut off from people or whether it's the, on top of that, the financial stress, um, all sorts of things. What are, what are your patients telling you about how they're coping? Yeah, so the responses in the survey um, don't surprise me. I think everybody is struggling with this as we would expect everybody to struggle with this. It's impacted every part of our lives. It's very stressful. Um, the, my patients and clients, pretty much this is the only thing we talk about and we really just talk about how to cope with this because it's incredibly stressful for us. We really underestimate how much threat we feel under, how much stress, um, sometimes financial, often other things as well, and how much effort it takes to just get through a COVID day. So people will say, I haven't done anything, but I'm exhausted. Um, but that's because it takes so much more effort to do things. So mm -hmm. before COVID, I never had to think about having a shower, mm -hmm. but now I have to consciously, deliberately make sure I have a shower. So we're using up energy just to do these basic tasks. Right. And, and, and the fact that we see these numbers exacerbated in Alberta, I suppose it's not surprising, too, because there are some parts of the country, uh, Alberta, Newfoundland and Labrador, Saskatchewan, where they've been hit economically and with the pandemic. And I can't imagine how that manifests itself uh, in terms of mental health. 
Yeah, we know that financial stress is a cause of, you know, mental strain and mental health issues. And so it's not surprising that in some of the provinces that have been hit more financially that you would see um, people struggling more. How are you talking to patients? Because uh, obviously you have a private practice. They're not coming to your house. How, how, how is that transition? And is it is it OK to do it, I guess, virtually in some capacity? Yeah, so we've transitioned all of the clients um, to virtual sessions. And psychology, I would say, is one of the um, disciplines that actually does translate fairly well into a virtual platform. So in lots of ways, I think it's great um, that all of this telehealth and telemedicine has um, happened as a result of the mm -hmm. pandemic. Again, I wish it could have come about in a different way, but given the pandemic, I think it's great that people can access these resources still. And I would you know, recommend after seeing those results that people should try to access mental health supports. There are a lot available virtually online for free this isn't ordinary times. We do all kinds of extraordinary things we would never consider doing before this pandemic. And so reaching out for mental health support might be one of those things we need to do. And what is your sort of best advice right now to Canadians? Because so many of, of us, uh, so many people are, are stuck at home and are now getting to the point where they're sort of done. They're sort of done with being home. They understand based on that same poll that they have to do it and, and they're okay with that. But mentally they're finding that challenging. So what are, you, what are you telling your patients? What would you tell Canadians about sort of digging in for another few weeks of this? Yeah, this is again, uh, you know, the results showed that people are suffering, but that Canadians are also willing to suffer for the greater good, that they want to protect people and they want to keep people safe. And But it is a struggle to do and we should recognize it's a struggle. So we want to be really deliberate about protecting our mental health, whether that's doing things that charge your battery, social connection, other things that you find meaningful or purposeful to your day, or reaching out for professional mental health support. Okay, Dana Lee Bagley, uh, it's probably not a topic we talk, uh, talk, talk enough about, but it sure is an important one. Thank you, I appreciate your time. Thank you. And as we wait for the Prime Minister here in the nation's capital, uh, he will come out of his front door there and give us a sense of uh, what his government is doing today to respond to the pandemic. I will go back to my colleagues, Vashi and David. Um, and and l let's talk a little bit about uh, the economy reopening, the loosening of some of those public health restrictions. Uh, we heard from uh, New Brunswick and Saskatchewan last week. We are expecting to hear more from the Ontario Premier at 1.30 Eastern. Um, a really delicate dance for the provinces, for the federal government. We see some of it happening in the United States and some of it seems to be just all over the place in terms of what they're doing. Uh, so I wouldn't mind hearing both of you on that. We've got about two minutes, Fashi. Yeah, I, I would just pick up right there, Rosie, and say it's interesting that we've seen, for example, Saskatchewan and New Brunswick unveil their plans to reopen the economy, which is pretty soon. It's happening a bit uh, in New Brunswick already and it's going to happen starting next week in Saskatchewan. But in both those provinces, you've seen a real, uh, you know, flattening of the curve, so to speak. So their, their number of cases, new cases, are, are very low. In Ontario, you have a very different situation. So the Premier is mm -hmm. going to come out today and lay out a plan for what this looks like going forward, which I think people are interested to hear. But sort of from a public health perspective, we seem to be at a different point in this province than the other two provinces that have unveiled this plan. That's not to say you shouldn't announce what's coming or sure. what you intend to do, but it, it certainly is a little bit, I feel like a different, uh, different tale to digest, I guess. And I think also what I'm interested to hear from the Prime Minister, he spoke last week about the plan to have some sort of federal guidelines in place. Mm -hmm. And we know that a conversation occurred with the premiers. When he, he told the premiers, according to Blaine Higgs, the premier of New Brunswick, whom I spoke with on Friday evening, that he wanted to get it out soon this week, those federal guidelines. It will be interesting to see how they mesh up against the provincial context, because even if you compare New Brunswick and Saskatchewan, there are some very germane differences in the sure. way in which those plans roll out. I get it. They're different provinces. But how does the federal government try and bridge the gap, I guess, or try and set some sort of bar for all provinces while well, they've already started the ball rolling? And I should say Quebec, too, expected to give us some sense Correct. of things this week as well. David, do you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, a key thing to consider is everyone can come up with a plan to reopen, and, and that will be phased in and based on science and data, and that's all important. But a big rate determining step in this is going to be Canada's supply of uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, because the minute you start opening up the economy, private sector workers who are staying at home right now and doing physical distancing are going to want some masks and some gloves uh, to keep themselves safe. Now, you can do the homemade cloth things, but there are certain businesses where you're going to require a level of medical grade thing. And uh, this was, a, I know, a concern that was raised by 
by some of the premiers in their conversation with the Prime Minister on Friday and something that he acknowledged that until the private sector has a good and consistent and steady supply of PPE, it's going to be hard to do wide-scale reopening. I mean, we're not there on testing yet as a country, certainly not here in the province of Ontario, and Quebec is starting to show a little bit of signs of lagging, even though Montreal is now the, the epicenter of this mm -hmm. pandemic in Canada. So there are other challenges just beyond having a plan and people wanting to go back to work. Uh, because if you reopen without enough testing and without enough personal protective equipment, you, you're setting the stage for a spike and a setback, which is something that all the political leaders and business leaders, just about every Canadian, uh, seems intent on avoiding. And you know, you saw with the protests in Ontario, Queen's Park over the weekend, uh, Doug Ford, who likes to brag that Ontario is open for business, called the people wanting Ontario open for business a bunch of yahoos and told them to go home. So while there is an eagerness to get it done, there's a, 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 an overwhelming desire to do this properly mm -hmm. and, and safely. Uh, yeah, there's an enormous amount of weight in terms of uh, your responsibility to the public in terms of making that decision. I should say that uh, last week the Premier of Ontario did downplay the idea that this could be back to normal, whatever that's going to look like by May long weekend. He had previously said that. That's that's not what he's saying now. Uh, his Minister of Education, Stephen Lecce, said over the weekend that publicly funded schools will remain closed until the end of May and that there'll be another update yet to come. So quite possible that that might not even happen at all. All right, here's Justin Trudeau coming out of his front door. Let's listen to the Prime Minister Bonjour of Canada. From coast to coast to coast, there are Canadians working long hours to keep each other safe and keep our country moving. But for everyone putting in an extra shift right now, there's someone else who wants to work but can't. Maybe you've been laid off because of the pandemic. Maybe you still have a job but aren't sure if your employer is going to keep you around next month. Whatever your situation may be, we're in your corner. Earlier this month, we introduced the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy to help protect your job or help you get back to, to work. And as of this morning, applications for this program have opened. Employers can now submit a claim for the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy through the Canada Revenue Agency. To access the 75% wage subsidy for your employees, go online through Canada.ca to reach this portal. Whether you're a charity that employs 200 people or a fast-growing startup that employs just 20, you will be eligible to up to $847 per week per employee. And you can expect to see this money soon. The CRA has partnered with financial institutions, so make sure you register for direct deposit to get your money quickly. The first payments should begin to arrive on May the 7th. For organizations like Focus on Nature, who sent me a letter last week, that's huge. Because of COVID-19, this charity from Guelph would have been forced to lay off all of their staff. But thanks to the wage subsidy, they can now keep their employees on the payroll and keep teaching kids about nature. And there are so many more stories, just like this one. There have been over 300,000 views of the online calculator we launched last week to help businesses prepare a claim. And since the portal opened at 6 a.m. this morning, almost 10,000 businesses have already applied for it. That gives you a sense of just how many people this program will help. Right across the country, it's going to keep businesses and workers connected. And that gives people certainty that they'll have a job now and in the months to come to support themselves and their family. And it means employers will not just have the help to stay afloat through the tough time, but they'll be ready to gear back up when things get better. We all know a local salon or a gym that's had to close, a neighborhood restaurant or shop that's really struggling. And more importantly, we all know people who work there. They deserve a hand to get through this, and that's what the wage subsidy is for. Depuis ce matin, les employeurs peuvent déposer Starting this morning, employers uh, are able to apply to receive the emergency wage subsidy on the Canada Revenue Agency website. You will find the portal online at Canada.ca, and there you can apply for your 75% subsidy. Whether you're running a charity that employs 200 people or a startup that employs 20 people, you can now receive up to $847 per employee every week. 
and this is money that you will be receiving soon. The Revenue Agency has been working with financial institutions to ensure that you can quickly receive your payments if you opt for direct deposit with the first payments uh, becoming available on May 7th. Since 6 a.m., almost 10,000 businesses have uh, already applied. This subsidy will help many people keep their job during this crisis, and it will also help employers to quickly start up their activities again once the crisis has ended. All of us uh, have in our neighborhood either a hair salon or a gym that has had to shut down, or a neighborhood restaurant or small boutique that's having trouble. And we all know people who work in those places. They deserve a hand to get through this, and that is the whole purpose of the wage subsidy. But certainly, a single program cannot help everyone. If your employer cannot rehire you, if you are a seasonal worker, or if you cannot find a job right now, we will help you. You have probably already received your first monthly check for the emergency benefit. If you need one next month, you simply have to go online and confirm that you are still eligible. But remember, you cannot keep both the wage subsidy and the emergency benefit. It's one or the other, not both. Now, we are working with other parties now to pass legislation that will allow us to introduce the measures that we have developed for students. We will be continuing this work in Parliament, and our first virtual session will take place tomorrow with an in-person session on Wednesday. At the same time, we will also be giving the provinces and territories the funding they need to top up the wages of essential workers. They're doing an amazing job, and they deserve to be fairly compensated. People are facing different challenges right now, and no single program can reach everyone. So we're coming at this from every angle. If your employer can't hire you back, if you're a seasonal worker, if you can't find a job right now, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit is there for you. You've probably already received your first check. And if you need the help again for the coming month, go online and reconfirm that you're still eligible. And I want to remind everyone, you won't be able to keep both the wage subsidy and the CERB. It's one or the other, not both. If you're a student, there's support for you, too. Right now, we're working with the other parties on legislation to get this help flowing. Parliament will have its first virtual sitting tomorrow and an in-person sitting on Wednesday. And if you're an essential worker, you deserve to be paid properly for your incredible work. Our government is doing its part to make that happen. Ontario came out with their plan over the weekend, and we're working with them to provide the support they need to deliver results. And we're currently in discussion with all the other provinces and territories to get their plans for essential workers in place. I'll have more updates for across the country in the coming days. As I said Saturday, we're also collaborating on shared guidelines for reopening the economy once the time comes. Different provinces and territories will be able to move at a different pace, but we need clear, coordinated efforts from coast to coast to coast. And no matter where you live, you need to continue following the recommendations from public health officials that will keep everyone safe. Comme je dis, as I said, we are also working with the provinces and territories with a view to gradually reopening the economy. Every province and every territory has a different reality, but we must work together to ensure the safety of all Canadians. We are all very anxious to return to a normal life, but we have to do that right, otherwise we risk losing all the progress we've made thus far. So you know what to do. Stay home. Continue to wash your hands frequently, and if you have to go out, keep a two-meter distance from you and others. Every day, we get closer to the time when all of this will be behind us. We get closer to the time when we can all celebrate together, but we are not there yet. Let's persevere together, friends. Thank you.
Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Premier ministre. On va commencer la période de questions par le téléphone aujourd'hui. Opérateur, c'est à vous. Thank you. Merci. Première question, Raymond Filion, TVA. À vous. Bonjour, Monsieur le Premier ministre. Good morning, Prime Minister. With respect to reopening the economy, you just referred to that. Now, if there are variations between regions and between provinces, do you believe that the Emergency Measures Act is something you should consider to avoid uh, unnecessary travel or maybe shutting down the borders between provinces? Well, as I've said before, I hope I won't need to do that, and I don't think I will at this point in time. People are are currently following, or the majority of people are following the recommendations uh, of uh, our health care experts and their provincial authorities. They're limiting their travel, they're staying home. And I think people know that it's very risky to start up uh, regular activities too quickly because then we could lose all the progress that we made uh, with such difficulty in recent weeks. So we must be careful, and I think Canadians know that. I believe that we have the necessary tools to ensure that things will work as they should. As I've said from the beginning, I'm uh, loath to use the Emergency Measures Act, and uh, up until this point, it has not been necessary. I think people have been following the guidelines, instructions of public health officials, of uh, provincial and, and federal uh, instructions. Uh, people have been doing the things necessary to keep themselves safe, uh, to keep their neighbours safe, to keep health workers safe, to limit their movements. Uh, we have uh, measures in place that people are following, as we reopen gradually, uh, I'm certain people will want to follow these measures because if we get this wrong, everything we have done, everything we have sacrificed over the past many weeks uh, could have been in vain. Uh, we need to make sure we do this very carefully based on absolutely the best scientific advice. En suivi. Follow up. Did you see or approve the plans that will be unveiled by Quebec and Ontario today? And could you give us some clear examples of the type of uh, guidelines that people would have to follow, for example, installing plexiglass of, to protect their employees? Can you give us uh, concrete examples of the type of measures you're looking at? Well, first of all, it's not up to the federal government to approve the measures that fall within provincial jurisdiction. We respect the authority of the provinces to make uh, the appropriate decisions for their own citizens. And as you know full well, from from one industry to the next, from one region to the next, the measures will be different to keep people safe. Now, what we are developing in partnership with the provinces is a series of essential principles, things like you have to ensure that we have uh, enough uh, testing capacity to reopen the economy. You must ensure that there are specific conditions in place for certain industries or economic sectors that you're planning to open. Those are principles we need to follow, but the provinces have the right and the obligation to put forward specific uh, things that work for them. The provinces uh, have the authority to determine what is in their best interest. It's not up to the federal government to check uh, or oversee the provinces in their areas of jurisdiction, and much of this falls within their areas of jurisdiction. Uh, they have uh, the responsibility to do what is right for their citizens. Uh, every province is in different situations. Regions within the provinces are in different situations. And I have full confidence uh, in uh, the premiers of the provinces and the territories uh, to move forward in a way that is right for them. What we've been working on with the provinces is uh, a set of guidelines and principles that can inform the decision makers in each region. Things like uh, make sure that you have enough uh, medical capacity to handle a potential surge. Make sure you're doing enough testing for your situation and have a plan to do more. Make sure uh, that there are specific guidelines in place for specific sectors or industries uh, that are appropriate to 
to keep people safe. It's not up to the federal government to determine what those are. We have tremendous confidence in the provinces who very much want to make sure that this happens the right way uh, and that we don't uh, fall back into a, uh, another phase like we're in this time as we gradually open up. Thank you. Next question, operator. Thank you. Merci. Next question, Mia Rabson, the Canadian Press. Line open. Good morning. You already mentioned that the the CERB and the wage subsidy are, can't both be uh, received by people. How do you see them sort of complementing each other or working together? And are you not worried that workers are sort of going to be caught in the middle and many of them are going to end up having to pay one or the other of them back? Uh, they are... D the. the <clears throat> The wage subsidy and the CERB are designed to support workers, to support people who've lost their paychecks. Uh, for someone who's lost their job, uh, whose employers can't hire them back with the wage subsidy, the CERB is there to give them uh, $500 a week, $2,000 a month, so that they can pay for their groceries and make through uh, this tough time while they're not receiving any sort of paycheck. But we also realized that it is really important for restoring our economic activity to full potential as quickly as possible that ideally people stay connected to their jobs, that they stay connected with their employers. And that's why we're facilitating a wage subsidy up to 75%, that is up to $847 a week, uh, that will go through the employers so that people can stay on the payroll and stay connected to their jobs so they have confidence that they'll have that job when we uh, have time, uh, when, when we're at the time to come back uh, as an economy. These are two different measures that aim to do the same sorts of things, make sure families and workers are able to make it through this time while doing the important, the, the right things to keep themselves safe and to make sure our economy goes, comes back strong. But it is one or the other. Because of the uncertainty, because of the application process, uh, it is possible that people will have received both the CERB and uh, the, uh, the wage subsidy. In that case, uh, they will have to, uh, over the course of, of the coming months, uh, pay one of them back. So uh, people should keep that in mind, that if you're getting both, uh, you should probably put uh, one of them aside so that you can pay that back uh, and you don't get uh, overly, uh, overly challenged with that down the road. But we recognize that getting money out to people quickly uh, and um, strongly, uh, reliably, was the most important thing, and that's what we did. Uh, we'll uh, figure out the next steps as we go and make sure that it's fair for everyone. Nous avions créé deux programmes pour aider ceux qui ont perdu leur paye. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont perdu leur emploi. D'abord, la prestation canadienne universelle qui donne des aides de santé pour les familles qui ont per
very complicated? And is there are there sort of things within the program to try and prevent double payments so that there isn't confusion about who has to pay what back? Uh, the the government agencies have a clear record of who gets what that will obviously help in sorting this out in the in the coming uh, coming months. Uh, the wage subsidy is retroactive to March 15th, uh, but as of the date that the CERB came in, a number of people didn't know if or whether they were going to get an eventual wage subsidy and so applied for it. Uh, the CERB is coming up on a reapplication moment and if people are receiving that wage subsidy, they shouldn't reapply uh, for the, uh, the CERB, the emergency response benefit. It is, it is a situation that um, is complex, but it is administered uh, by uh, you know, different processes within government that are clear to keep separate. Uh, if you apply through your employer uh, for, if the employer applies for the wage subsidy, uh, that money will flow for you and uh, you no longer need to apply for the CERB, you no longer qualify for the CERB. Okay. Uh, this is a situation where we wanted to ensure that people would receive money quickly, and that's why we introduced the emergency response benefit. But as people receive the wage subsidy, they will no longer need the CERB and will no longer apply to receive that benefit. And we have robust systems in government to determine who received what, and who receive both benefits. In that case, they will have to uh, repay one. But for the time being, time being, we decided that it was more important to get more money out to more people in this crisis because we know that people need support. We knew that we had to make choices, and the choice to send more money out to people quickly was, in my opinion, the right choice for the economy, and we will figure out the next steps together in terms of repayment. Thank you. Merci. Prochaine question, Hélène Buzetti, Le Devoir, à vous. I'd like to come back to my colleague's question from TVA about uh, the relaxation of lockdown. In Quebec, they've talked about uh, herd immunity to facilitate the reopening of schools. Now, some people have serious uh, doubts about that concept, including Dr. Tam. Do you believe that the reopening of schools in Quebec would be premature? Now, there are still many, many questions about herd immunity or even individual human uh, immunity. There is no evidence that people who have been infected by the virus will not be able to become infected a few months later. This is too new a virus to have access to that information. So that's why we are encouraging people to be very careful in reopening the economy. And it's also the reason why we introduced an immunity task force on COVID-19. This is a task force that will be based in Montreal, as a matter of fact, and they will be doing the necessary research to get a better understanding of the immunity aspect of things and how we can use that to protect Canadians. But this is a mid to long term project. For the time being, we have to be very careful. And I know that all the provinces are now being very careful about reopening the economy in the right way. Because because we do not want uh, a setback. Uh, we know uh, that there is still a lot of uncertainty around uh, the science of immunity whether or not someone who has contracted COVID-19 uh, is protected from contracting it again uh, a few months later. That is still uncertain. There's a lot of research and science going on uh, on that top topic uh, ac across the country around the world. We launched uh, the uh, Pan-Canadian Task Force on Immunity from COVID-19 uh, just last week. So we have top scientists that are going to be working extremely hard to figure out uh, what uh, is the reality around immunity in Canada and how we can use it to keep people safer. But this is a work, work that will go on, uh, it'll have immediate results in some levels, but it'll be a medium and long-term work that needs to be done. 
That's why uh, we have to be very, very careful and cautious every step of the way uh, in reopening the economy because we don't want to uh, come back to where we are. And I have confidence that every province is taking very seriously this responsibility to be careful because nobody uh, wants to have gone through all this for nothing. Yes, as a sub-question, you mentioned that Wednesday the Parliament will be having an in-person session. You talked about uh, the legislation on students. Now, can we expect that legislation to be debated and passed on Wednesday? And if not, is it because there is something that's blocking? Well, it is our intention to move forward with that legislation to help students. And we... Uh, over the weekend, we discussed the situation with the other parties, and we are working with them with a view to getting that legislation passed. It's an important measure, and people recognize that many students will not have any jobs this summer, and we need to support them during this period, not just so that they can pay for their groceries and rent uh, these months, but also because we want them to stay stay in school and be able to pay their tuition for next year and the years after that. Looking after our young people means looking after our future, and that's what we're going to do. Thank you. Next question, Cormac McSweeney, City News, line open. Hello, Prime Minister. Um, you've been talking about um, federal guidelines for provinces to follow in terms of reopening their economy. We're expecting the plans from Ontario and Quebec. We've already heard plans from Saskatchewan and New Brunswick. When are you going to release the full list of federal guidelines? I know you gave some examples earlier, but the full list of federal guidelines, uh, because you know we have nearly half the provinces now releasing their plans. We have been working with the provinces over the past weeks uh, to develop a shared set of guidelines. These will not be federal guidelines. They will be guidelines that we agree to, uh, all of us, the, the 13 premiers and the prime minister, uh, all of our different uh, orders of government, uh, to inform ourselves going forward. It is something uh, that has worked together to give Canadians a frame within which uh, they can see the actions being taken in their particular regions. Uh, it is important and it is historic, the level of collaboration between uh, provinces and territories and the federal government, and that is going to continue. So uh, we are uh, continuing to work on uh, finalizing those guidelines and hope to have them out uh, in the coming days so Canadians can see them. But I can tell you that already the thinking that has gone into building those shared guidelines with the provinces and territories uh, is already informing the decisions that they move forward with in, uh, in announcing reopening plans. Following up, Cormac? And, uh, yeah, just wondering as well, you've announced uh, commercial rent relief for uh, small businesses, medium-sized businesses across the country, and Premier Doug Ford has also called for some sort of residential rent relief. Is that on the, on the table for the federal government? Is it uh, in, work, in the works right now with the provinces? We recognize that Canadians need money for an awful lot of things, particularly when they no longer have a paycheck coming in, whether it's rent, whether it's groceries, whether it's supporting their family members. That's why we move forward rapidly on the Canada Emergency Response Benefit and uh, the 75% wage, wage subsidy that uh, applications have launched today for. These are meant to replace income that Canadians won't have coming in uh, over the course of, of this, uh, this economic slowdown. Uh, and that can be used for rent, for groceries, for a range of things. Uh, if provinces in, in whom uh, the relationship between renters and landlords uh, is their jurisdiction uh, want to move forward uh, with more help for, uh, for, for residential rent, um, they can, uh, they, they can, of course, do that. Uh, we will focus on uh, giving the benefits to Canadians that will replace as uh, much of their, their paychecks so that they can pay their essentials. Uh, small businesses uh, needed extra support for their commercial rents uh, on top of the wage subsidy, and that's what we've done. Good morning, Prime Minister. Brian Mullen, Global News. One of the groups still feeling isolated and vulnerable are seniors. Many have had to absorb an extra cost of delivery services on a fixed income. Others have to pay additional uh, dispensing fees at the pharmacy. Last week you said help was coming. How much longer will seniors have to wait? Oh. 
we knew that moving forward on replacing people who lost and were counting on their paychecks uh, through COVID-19 uh, was the priority. And that's why we move forward with the, the CERB and uh, the wage subsidy, which launches today. Uh, we then recognize that uh, students who often start their summer jobs in early May after finishing their term at post-secondary education needed help as well, which is why we're moving forward on that. Uh, seniors are also facing a tremendous level of vulnerability because of COVID-19. It is uh, health vulnerability. It is uh, being, uh, being uh, isolated further and challenges around uh, mental health and isolation uh, and difficulty sometimes getting groceries and, uh, and uh, getting the supports they need. Uh, we have moved forward on a number of things to ensure that they get supports, but we're also looking at uh, further supports specifically for the most vulnerable uh, low-income seniors who are truly challenged. Can you outline some of the options that you're looking at? Uh, as I said, we're looking at uh, things uh, like supports for the most vulnerable st uh, seniors who are seeing uh, extra costs because of COVID-19, uh, and we will keep working on that and have more to say soon. Well, Prime Minister Tom Perry, CBC. Um, municipalities have taken a big hit uh, during the pandemic. Have you given any more thought to helping them? And if you do, how would that work with the provinces? Uh, we continue to work with the provinces on the challenges that they're facing. We see municipalities uh, uh, absorbing many extra costs uh, because of COVID-19. Uh, they are uh, the responsibility of the provinces, of course, and we respect the constitutional division of powers in this country. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we are looking for ways uh, to make sure that municipalities uh, have the necessary uh, uh, flexibility and tools to, uh, to, uh, to keep their citizens safe and to deliver necessary services. Uh, but those are conversations that were uh, ongoing with the provinces. Can I ask you as well, um, when uh, the economy starts to reopen gradually, you're going to have a lot of businesses that are going to be in the, on the market for um, personal protective equipment. Uh, there's a high demand for it out there already. Are you making any kind of plans to, to deal with that? Uh, every single day, every week, we are ramping up our supplies of personal protective equipment. Uh, we have been ensuring uh, that as much as possible our healthcare workers, our frontline essential workers, get the equipment they need to keep themselves safe. But as we look at uh, reopening the economy in different parts of the country, uh, we know there is going to be an increased demand for personal protective equipment. That's one of the principles and guidelines we have to keep in mind as we look at reopening. Will there be enough? enough PPE for various sectors to open up, and that's a piece of it. We, we are expecting to receive uh, a shipment of uh, PPE uh, every day uh, on flights from China this week. Um, we are ramping up our domestic production capacities for personal protective equipment because we know that uh, is going to be an important source for uh, Canadian businesses and Canadian industry in the coming, uh, uh, coming months. Uh, these are all things we're doing to make sure uh, we can take the decisions that will gradually reopen the economy while keeping Canadian safe. Bonjour, M. Trudeau, Philippe Vincent Foisy de Radio-Canada. Sur la, la PCU et l'aide aux étudiants, to the emergency benefit and students, will you be making changes so that there's more of an incentive to return to work? Because right now, if you go to work and you make $1,001, you cannot receive the $2,000. So you have to work a lot more hours, and that's not really an incentive to get people back to work full time. Uh, employers and people are saying that this is not something Thing that fosters a desire to return to work. What do you say about that? Now, we are right now in a lockdown because of COVID-19. There are not enough jobs out there for Canadians across the country. Yes, we are aware of the challenges in terms of an incentive to work, and we are trying to ensure that the industries that need workers will be able to secure them. But we are facing a situation where millions of Canadians cannot receive a paycheck for the work they've done, and therefore, we need to support them. There just aren't enough jobs right now for Canadians. There aren't enough jobs for students. So we need to support them. That is the decision that the government had to make. But why not make it more flexible? Why not provide more flexibility so that someone can get part of the benefit, but can also go and work perhaps in a senior 
seniors' home uh, for several hours, and that way we, we, we would be encouraging people to go and work where we need them to work. Uh, can, can we not have that flexibility? Well, we did uh, reflect on that right from the beginning to uh, in terms of uh, the right industries, the right workers, and how to proceed. But the fact is that we had to get that benefit out to people quickly so that they could pay for their rent or pay for their groceries, and particularly so that they could make the choice of staying at home and self-isolating and thereby protecting uh, the health care workers and their neighbors. If we had not provide adequate support to workers in order to replace their lost a paycheck, they would have been forced uh, to be more vulnerable in order to help their families, and that would have extended the pandemic and the crisis we're currently in. So we decided to get money out to them quickly, and I know that more than 8 million Canadians are now receiving the emergency response benefit. And we know that uh, every element uh, of complexity did uh, increase the risk of not being able to get it out quickly so that people could that get that support. And as a result, we decided to go forward quickly and to make things as simple as possible. And that's what we did. Hi, Prime Minister. Uh, Mackenzie Gray from CTV News. Um, over the last number of weeks, you've said that life will not return to normal until we get a vaccine. We asked Dr. Tam about those questions on the weekend. Uh, she said, and this is a quote, that it's very premature to comment on if, we, uh, if we'll get a vaccine and if we do, how effective it will be. So considering her cautious words on our ability to get a vaccine, is it still your position that life will return to normal only if we do get one? N normal... Um is something that is a long way off for all of us. And uh, if we want life to get back to the way it was exactly before, it won't. There will be differences uh, even a few years from now that we will have learned from dealing with this global pandemic that I think will be important lessons. As we move forward over the coming months, uh, we will be able to see careful reopenings in certain sectors of the economy, certain things being allowed as people try to get back to uh, something a little more like normal. But until we have a vaccine uh, for COVID-19 or a system of treatments uh, that are equivalent to a vaccine where we can be sure that people uh, will not um, you know, be, uh, you know, they will not have, uh, have COVID-19 be as lethal as it is now, um, we are going to have to be very careful. That caution will remain because at any time, if we loosen our measures too much, we could find ourselves back in a tremendous spike. Historians remember from the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic that the spring was pretty bad, but the fall was much worse. We need to stay vigilant every step of the way. Uh, and that's what we're focused on so that this disruption to our economy, to our lives, uh, that is difficult to go through right now, um, will not have been for nothing. And we will continue to keep ourselves safe uh, for the coming months. Okay. What is a normal life will take a long time to return, and even at this point, in two or three years from now, even once a vaccine against COVID-19 is available, we will have changed our behavior. We will have taken measures as a society that will be different from what we used to do. We will continue to evolve, but we want to be able to start up certain activities in the months to come that uh, will mean that there is some relaxation of the current lockdown, but I think we have to be very careful. Until we have a vaccine or until we have uh, treatments that are the equivalent of a vaccine that can keep us safe and that can allow us to not be so concerned about the spread of COVID-19. 19, you know, until that happens, there is still a risk that there will be a spike in the number of cases if we are not careful and if we do not follow the public health recommendations. 
Historians remind us that the Spanish flu epidemic in 1918 uh, involved a very bad spring, but an absolutely disastrous uh, fall. And that's why we must remain vigilant and we must be very careful in order to not uh, lose all the progress we've made thus far in when it comes to limiting the spread of the virus. And even the WHO have discussed the idea of a health passport, which would allow businesses and cities, other people, to determine, uh, you would show whether or not you've had COVID-19. And I know you mentioned earlier that the science is still out on immunity uh, and antibody tests, but the idea of Canadians having to show uh, personal health information in exchange for going back to work, going back to school, is that an idea that you're comfortable with? That is even premature to speculate about. There is no conclusive evidence right now that having contracted COVID-19 once protects you from contracting it again a few months later. This is too new a virus. Uh, scientists are working very hard on exactly that, whether the presence of antibodies uh, in someone uh, will uh, protect them from, from uh, catching COVID-19 again. But we don't know that yet. That's why we have to be very, very careful, because if we make a mistake on this and uh, allow uh, too much loosening of our economy and of our restrictions, and we suddenly get uh, another massive spike, it is going to be devastating, not just for our economy, but for people uh, who uh, will have gone through all these weeks of uh, sacrifices and limitations for nothing. That's something we want to avoid. It's uh, premature to talk about uh, passports or immunity because we still do not know whether someone who has contracted COVID-19 is protected from contracting it several months later. There is no conclusive evidence on that. Now, one day, perhaps soon, we may know that, but that's not the case now. So. It would not be prudent at this time to base our thinking on the idea of herd immunity when we don't know whether that's a reality or not. Canada giving us his daily briefing today. The focus on the beginning of the wage subsidy program, which starts today, which brings me to our next guest, who I'm going to try and squeeze in before the top of the hour, and that is Michael Carmichael. Uh, we have spoke to him before. He's the president of CEA of Up Auto. Good to see you. Um, you've laid off more than half your staff, Michael. Do you plan to tap yes. into this program? Have you already applied this morning? We have already applied, and uh, Keisha, my controller, has been uh, on the site already, and uh, it, it's a program we're very excited about and to have brought 10 people back on uh, because of it. And, and so has your application already gone through? Do you have a sense of how easy it was or how difficult it was? Well, I, I think just understanding the various mechanics of, of what categories of, of um, kind of wages are covered um, and just kind of doing the math to figure out who, who you know, who bene who's a net beneficiary of the program. Uh, has been has been some uh, you know there's been some movement and some learning on that absolutely but it's uh, I think once we get the the mechanics of the equation down it, it's it's pretty uh, straightforward. So that's ten people you can bring back. Do you anticipate bringing yeah. more people back, or are there people that are paid sort of outside of the subsidy and then it becomes too costly for you to bring them back, given you'd have to make up some of the difference? Yeah, it, it just comes down to uh, balancing between who who is uh, you know relative to being on the serve versus coming back. Uh, some people, it's a material difference, and and as I've made those calls last week to folks who were bringing back on, it's you know there's some more some more monthly cash flow there. Make sure you're supporting the local uh, restaurants and you know do what you can to get the economy going with this increase of cash flow. And uh, you know as the prime minister said, it is critical to keep uh, folks connected to us as the employer and keep the dialogue and the relationship going and make people uh, confident that they've got a role to come back to. Uh, and that's, uh, that's, that's a major plank of what this uh, subsidy allows us to do from a uh, liquidity and, and uh, survivability ultimately. Okay, Michael Carmichael, sorry I didn't have more time for you, but appreciate getting your instant reaction and, and glad it all went okay for you this morning. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Have a great That's day. Michael Carmack, a Carmichael, a car dealership owner who says he's going to take advantage of that wage subsidy program, bring back 10 employees. The prime minister says more than 10,000 businesses have applied as of 6 a.m. this morning. That uh, it ends our coverage here on CBC News. If you want to continue watching, CBC News Network, cbc.ca. Thanks for watching. Hi again, I'm Rosemary Barton here in Ottawa. Thanks for joining us on CBC News Network, streaming wherever you might be in the world on cbcnews.ca and our CBC News app. We are, of course, tracking the big developments on COVID-19 at this hour. The Prime Minister confirming just moments ago that 10,000 businesses have already applied for the government's wage subsidy program since applications opened at 6 a.m. Eastern this morning. A reminder that that program covers 75% of employee salaries for companies that were for Forced to lay off staff during COVID-19, so that's up to 847 bucks per worker. The Prime Minister says businesses can expect to see money as early as next week. He also talked at length about the need for a clear and coordinated plan to reopen the economy across the country when the time comes, province by province. We'll look at some of the challenges of getting those, uh, getting the businesses back and opening in Ontario primarily, because Premier Doug Ford is going to lay out his government's plan uh, within the next hour at around 1.30 Eastern. So we're tracking all of those stories. Let me bring in my colleagues, the CBC's David Cochran and the host of Power and Politics, Bashi Capellas. Um, I, we could talk about wage subsidy if you like, but I, I wouldn't mind starting with uh, some of the things the Prime Minister said around the reopening of the economy um, and some clear messages he had as well around the notion of uh, herd immunity, which is something that uh, Dr. Tam was asked about on the weekend because it is a notion, uh, certainly, that, I mean, it exists scientifically, certainly, but, but in Quebec, they were sort of predicating a reopening of the economy on that idea. Um, and it doesn't sound like the science backs that up for now. So I'll, I'll get both of you to weigh in on, on those things because it was, it was sort of interesting to hear the Prime Minister Bashi. Yeah, Dr. Tam earlier this weekend was quite clear that the science doesn't back that up at this moment in time. We've seen some evidence of that in jurisdictions around around the world that decided to pursue the herd immunity route right from the start, that it didn't work and that they had to backtrack and end up closing their economy like our country did and other countries, of course, in the world. Uh, I think the other interesting thing to hit on, so the Prime Minister said basically it's even too early to, 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 to start talking about <coughs> that, and conjunctly also talked about the, something else Dr. Tam said this weekend, and that is around her hesitancy to proclaim the inevitability of a vaccine. We have heard from the Prime Minister constantly over the past number of weeks that a full return to normal would not happen until there is a vaccine. Uh, there isn't always a vaccine. There are obviously a huge number. I think it's unprecedented what uh, Dr. Bogosh and other infectious disease specialists have told us is that it's unprecedented the number of teams. I think there's 86 around the world working on the possibility of this vaccine. So in no way do I want to say it's not going to happen. But there are instances in the past where no vaccine has been found. And you heard the prime minister almost amend the language a bit today in response to a question from one of our colleagues about that, saying that yeah, there won't be sort of any kind of normalcy or that full return return to normal, I'm paraphrasing for a second, but unless there's a vaccine or a suite or a set of treatments mm -hmm, that can mm -hmm. help mitigate the public health effects of this, uh, of the spread of this virus. And so I think it is sort of interesting as we follow this almost bouncing ball to know that there isn't a guarantee of A, that set of treatments or B, that vaccine, which is kind of unnerving because we are being told so constantly that though we can carefully reopen sectors of the economy, we won't be living a normal life where we're traveling or all businesses are open or we're sitting next to each other very closely uh, in, the, in a restaurant until there is sort of some kind of treatment or some kind of vaccine. Again, with the caveat that there are so many scientists, an unprecedented number of scientists working on it right now. Yeah, there was a good story on The National last night. There's a good story on our website right now about the many Canadian scientists that yes. are, are doing that because the government's pumped a lot of money into that as well. Uh, and I think last week it was maybe Dr. Tam who made the comparison to um, to AIDS. Or maybe it was you, David. I don't know. We were talking about how AIDS doesn't take a vaccine, but there is plenty of, um, there's plenty of treatment now for people who are um, HIV positive. I'm not saying that... Uh, 
you know, that w where we know where we're going, but I, I think your point is a good one, Vashi, that, that we might be looking just for some way to um, protect ourselves or heal as opposed to a vaccine, depending on how things go. David, uh, lots of talk there too about, about the reopening of the economy, and he was very careful uh, when asked by a, a French reporter, a Quebecois reporter, um, about whether the, they were going to, you know, make sure the provinces were doing the right thing. He was very careful to say, no, 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 we're not the boss of the provinces. That's not how it's going to go. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, we keep saying reopening the economy, and I wonder if that's really too narrow because yes. schools and things like that are part of the conversation. It's really reopening society in, in a lot of ways. And, and the conversation on Friday at the First Minister's meeting was, look, we need some sort of national sense of how to do this. The final call rests with the provinces and in some cases even municipalities on how they're going to operate in, in certain ways. But take, for example, a trucking company that goes across different borders. It wants a general idea uh, of what it would be if it has to do a shipment from British Columbia to Ontario, how that will work. If you're a, a national chain that operates in, in multiple jurisdictions, you want sort of a, an idea of what the common markers would be in terms of how to reopen and how to stay open, in terms of what your expectations would be from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, or even in a city like here, Rosie, where people like live in Gatineau, work in Ottawa, live in mm -hmm. Ottawa, work in Gatineau, you're going back and forth between two provincial jurisdictions and if things are going to reopen on one side that could have implications on the other side you sort of want to have at least a broad understanding uh, of what the standards would be from place to place um, but look you look at everything the prime minister says when he's asked about this uh, about reopening and quickly and I, I, I would note that we've gone from asking the government questions of why aren't you getting a lot of money to people faster to now asking why are you giving them so much money? There's no incentive to work. Right. It's, a, it's an amazing transition in just five weeks. But it, it's the point he keeps making and the programs they keep rolling out is to allow people to hunker down. Mm -hmm. uh, we're still largely broadly in that phase. I mean, there are different examples across the country. You know, British Columbia is not Ontario. Places like Prince Edward Island, for example, Rosie, where the daily update is no new cases, mm -hmm. small population, everyone's largely recovered. With essentially one bridge, one boat, one airport, you can close down and reopen at the same time in a place like Prince Edward Island if you keep restrictions on in travel coming into the province. So it varies right like it, it's not one pandemic the the Montreal experience just a little ways down the highway from here is very different than the Ottawa experiences that city is really the epicenter in Canada right now so the provinces and, and the the territories are going to be able to make decisions to meet their specific needs what the federal government is trying to do it's a little bit on this is a little bit like what Theresa Tam is trying to do uh, with the public health agency, sort of a national sort of benchmark, and then the provinces adapt to those mm -hmm. based on their individual circumstances. Um, I'm, we're standing by for the federal briefing here from cabinet ministers and public health officials. I, I must have bad eyesight. I don't see anyone sitting there yet, so I will. No movement yet. Great. Thank you. Uh, let's. Uh, I'm going to come back to both of you, but I want to talk a little bit more about the Ontario plan to reopen the economy, or as David's saying, reopen society. Uh, Premier Doug Ford scheduled to speak in just over an hour. We'll, of course, bring that to you live. Uh, but let's bring in uh, the CBC's Mike Crawley, our Queen's Park reporter, uh, who's been following this. So. Uh, Mike, obviously uh, there is uh, some pressure to reopen the economy, although the vast majority of public opinion polls show that Canadians are, we're, we're okay, we can, we can hang tight a little longer. Um, what, what do we know about what kinds of things the Premier is considering here and, and how quickly he can do it? Now, Rosemary, it's really competing pressures, right? There's that pressure to reopen the economy and that uh, big pressure to get things right. So uh, it, it seems to be that uh, the, what I'm going to be looking for is uh, what are the first steps? Because we know, for one thing, this is going to happen in phases. There's not going to be one single reopening of the whole economy. Uh, what are the workplaces, for instance, that uh, Ontario decides to open first? In, in particular, like what kind of workplaces? Premier Ford's already hinted that uh, he's he'd be looking at uh, workplaces where it's most easy to maintain physical distancing and even you know referred to outdoors specifically so mm -hmm. I think there there could be some reopening of outdoor space uh, mm -hmm. first for, mm -hmm. for, for for people that would be one one thing and then I'll be looking to see what are then the next steps how many phases do they envision doing this in uh, is it uh, d d is there anything in the way of a timeline because I know that's a really hard thing for them to to be able to, to specify to say well you know, we'll take the next step in a certain number of weeks yeah. or, or anything like that. So uh, I'm sure there will be lots of unanswered questions from uh, yeah. after today, but there will be a lot more certainty about the, the steps that Ontario is going to take.
Yeah, um, so I, I think my ministers are coming in, but I do want to ask you this, Mike Crawley, because there was a sense, on, well, there was a clear indication over the weekend about school uh, not opening to the end of May. And of course, school and daycare, uh, really critical to anybody being able to go back to work. So should, should that give us any kind of hint about how slowly this is going to happen? Yeah, there's no question that it's going to uh, happen anything other than slowly, the exact time frame, who knows. I'm seeing, though, uh, Rosemary, all sorts of different uh, thoughts about uh, schools, for instance. Instance, uh, do they bring in some sort of phased uh, uh, a reopening of schools? Do they reopen schools in particular for younger kids first mm -hmm. to, to help uh, parents out? So lots of possibilities out there and it's going to be interesting to compare how the different provinces approach uh, the school uh, question uh, differently. Also, are there regional differences? I mean, uh, sure. Ontario's got 400 uh, new cases every day, but very, very few of those cases are happening in northern Ontario. And uh, I asked the Premier whether they're considering some sort of regional differences uh, in the reopening. And, and he said that that's certainly under consideration, but it might be difficult uh, to, to manage. So uh, lots of stuff at play. Okay, Mike Crawley, thank you. Appreciate you joining us. Um, of course, the Premier's press conference will be at 1.30 Eastern. For now, though, let's go back to Ottawa for the federal minister's briefing and public health officials. This is Deputy Prime Minister Christian Freeland. Will be gradual and done in cooperation and will be based on science. So let me just start by emphasizing something the Prime Minister said earlier today. If you are an essential worker, we are working with the provinces and territories to ensure that your wages are boosted if your paycheck doesn't reflect the incredible work you're doing every day. Thank you. I also wanted to emphasize that we are actively discussing reopening plans with our provincial and territorial partners. I want to reassure Canadians that this process will be gradual, it will be collaborative, and it will be guided by science and our obligation to protect the health and safety of Canadians. Okay, today we will hear from Canada's Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Theresa Tam, the Deputy Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Howard New, by video link, the Minister for Small Business, Export Promotion and International Trade, Mary Ng, et le Président du Conseil du Trésor, and the uh, President of the Treasury Board, Jean-Yves Duclos. Dr. Tam. Hello, everyone, and bonjour à toutes et à tous. I'll start with the latest Good morning, everyone. On COVID-19 in Canada. There are now 47,327 confirmed cases, including 2,617 deaths. To date, labs across Canada have tested over 717,000 people, with about 7% of these testing positive. Another week is upon us, and I know that we're all weary, and the longer days and warmer weather are making us all feeling increasingly antsy. In fact, these past weeks have made the words of millions of kids ring true as they shout from the back seat, are we there yet? <laughs> I think I speak for all of us when I say we have never felt more like that kid. Though I'm sorry to say no, not quite yet. And though we are getting closer all the time, we can't let go of the wheel yet. My reflection this past weekend was very much on the bigger picture. So when I think about where we are right now, with outbreaks in vulnerable settings and underserved populations driving the epidemiology of COVID-19, I am reminded of the critical importance of addressing inequities. This pandemic has exposed the fragility of some of our populations, especially those living in long-term care homes, group housing, those experiencing homelessness, or vulnerable Indigenous communities. It has also highlighted the basic subsistence challenges of those working in our essential services who cannot self-isolate, such as our healthcare workers and those growing, delivering and stocking our food, medicines and other vital supplies. The bad bugs are not going away. So if we are to end the tragedy of increased disease and death rates in vulnerable populations, we need to make things right, right now. This is not just someone else's problem or someone else's sorrow. Inequities touch us all. They affect the health and social well-being of all Canadians, just as they diminish our humanity. 
That means we need to look beyond the health system to the expanse of the public health, social, cultural and economic fabric of our society. And this approach needs to be woven into both our cautious descent down the epidemic curve, as well as going forward to living with COVID-19. To put this virus in a corner where we manage it and not the other way around, we need to adapt our daily lives to the need for hand washing, physical distancing and other control measures. And at the same time, we need to build protective supports into our social fabric to provide long term protection against future waves of COVID-19 and future pandemics of emerging disease. Last night, Canadian luminaries from the worlds of music, sports, science, advocacy, television and cinema brought us together virtually through the Stronger Together special. In addition to being extremely emotional and entertaining, it raised much needed funds for food banks across Canada and allowed us to pay tribute to the heroic efforts of our frontline workers during this crisis. Stronger Together is how we are going to get through this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tam. And now I give the floor to Dr. Howard New. Now I give the floor to Dr. Howard New. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. First of all, here are the last figures on COVID-19 in Canada. 47,327 confirmed cases, 2,617 2, deaths. Labs have analyzed samples of more than 717,000 people, about 7% have tested positive. We're starting a new week, and we know that we're weary, and longer days and better weather is making us febrile. This week has given us a good look at the millions of kids who shout from the back seat, are we there yet? I think I speak for all of us when I say we've never felt more like that kid. Though I'm sorry to say, no, not quite. And though we are getting closer all the time, we can't let go of the wheel yet. My reflection this past weekend was very much on the big picture. So when I think about where we are right now with outbreaks in vulnerable settings and underserved populations, driving the epidemiology of COVID-19, I'm reminded of the critical importance of addressing inequities. The pandemic has exposed the fragility of some of our populations, especially those living in long-term care homes, group housing, homelessness or vulnerable Indigenous communities. It has also highlighted the basic subsistence challenges of those working in our essential services who cannot self-isolate, such as healthcare workers and those growing, delivering and stocking, stocking our food, medicines and other vital supplies. The bad bugs are not going away. So if we are to end the tragedy of increased disease and death rates in vulnerable populations, we need to make things right now, right now. This is not just someone else's problem or someone's sorrow. Inequalities touch us all. They affect the health and social well-being of all Canadians, just as they diminish our humanity. That means we need to look beyond the health system to the expanse of the public health, social, cultural and economic fabric of our society. And this approach needs to be woven into both our cautious descent down the epidemic curve as well as going forward to living with COVID-19. To put this virus in a corner where we manage it and not the other way around, we need to adopt our daily lives to the needs of hand washing, physical distancing and other control measures. At the same time, we need to build protective supports into our social fabric to provide long term protection against future waves of COVID-19 and future pandemics of emerging disease. That's when we'll know. We are well and truly there. Thank you.
Merci, Dr. Nu. Thank you, Dr. Nu. Now we will small business export promotion international trade. Mary Ng. Mary, please. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Prime Minister. Good afternoon, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. Good afternoon, everyone. Directly today to small business owners and entrepreneurs in communities all across the country. You have worked incredibly hard to turn your idea into success, successful businesses. And for so many of you, that means having to miss birthdays, recitals, family dinners throughout the years. And for you, this is personal. And it's also personal for me, not only as the minister responsible for helping small business su succeed, but as someone who grew up in a family run business, I understand how devastating it must be to close your doors, struggle to pay your valued staff, or feel like you might have to give up on this dream that you've worked so hard to make a reality. Our government is there for you. As of today, you can now apply to receive the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy that will cover 75% of your employees' wages, up to $847 a week. If you're a business of any size, a charity, or a nonprofit organization, and you've seen a drop in revenue for the months of March, April, and May, you can apply through your My Business account or the Canada Revenue Agency's online portal. Keep in mind that this benefit is retroactive to March the 15th, and it's available for a period of 12 weeks or until June the 6th. We have worked hard to make this process as simple and efficient as possible. All claims will be approved through the CRA's automated verification system, and your payment will be sent to you on, Mar on May the 5th. We have partnered with banks and financial institutions to enroll payroll accounts for direct deposit, which means that businesses should begin to see money in their accounts as of May the 7th. For applications that require additional checks or more information from the employer, a secondary verification should take no more than 72 hours to complete. This wage subsidy will not only help save Canadian jobs, it's about keeping your teams together, which we know will be key to your success once we're on the other side of this and we are into recovery. Our team recently heard from a bakery owner in Atlanta, Canada. She will be using a 75% wage subsidy to pay for her five employees. In turn, this will free up the cash flow she has to pay for other operating expenses, including improving on an online ordering platform since she's had to close her doors. Simply put, this means relief for this bakery owner and so many business owners in every corner of our country, along with their employees. We're hearing of stories of resilience from this uh, from this, like this, all over Canada, and our work is far from done. We're still listening. We will continue to do everything possible to support you, your businesses, your valued employees, and families across the country. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Okay, thank, thank you very much. I now give the floor to the President of the Treasury Board, Jean-Yves Duclos. Thank you very much. The main message by the Prime Minister this morning was one of assistance and mutual assistance in decision-making, first of all. So we want to underscore the extraordinary collaborative work of the provinces and territories and the federal government to properly develop shared uh, cooperative decisions to guide us in important ways in the coming weeks by using considerable national expertise of scientists and researchers across the country and expecting, of course, that this information, this advice will be applied locally by provincial and municipal administrations and also to guide entrepreneurs and companies in this important exercise that they have to conduct in order to ensure the safety and security of work in the coming weeks and months. Secondly, aid to essential workers that are often working for very modest wages. We want to thank them for everything they do for our communities, 
and for all the people who need them. And we're very pleased with the progress in the discussions, as the Prime Minister mentioned this morning, between the federal government and the provinces and territories. And as Minister Ng just said, aid to uh, employers to pay their wages. On April 11, just a few days ago, the House of Commons voted for the proper provisions to in store this wage subsidy on April 21st, 10 days later, that is last Monday, we were able to launch a website that 300,000 companies visited in the last few days. Today, April 27th, 16 days after this was adopted in the House of Commons and adopted the regulations, we have the opportunity, thanks to the remarkable work of CRA employees, to ask a company to file for their wage subsidy. And as Minister Ng just said a few moments ago, as of May 5th, that is next week, answers will be provided to companies, and on May 7th, payments will start to flow and deposited. So that is because of the extraordinary collaborative work and as President of the Treasury Board, once again, I want to thank all public servants who are working in very demanding conditions, both professionally and personally, for the remarkable work they do, and it's so appreciated because they're helping Canadians. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Yves. Of course, our Minister of Health, Patty Haidu, is here as well and available to answer your questions, as are we all. Carl. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. As usual, we'll start on the phone with three questions. One question, one follow-up. Operator. Thank you. Please press star 1 at this time if you have a question. Please press star 1 right now. Good morning. My first question would be for Mr. Duclos or Ms. Freeland. The Canadian Army is deployed in Quebec. Uh, has been there for several days to see what the needs are in long-term care facilities. So there's been a reconnaissance mission in the past few days. Can we get more details today about how many additional troops will be sent to Quebec and when they will start to arrive? Uh, answer. To begin with, we are fully engaged in organizing this deployment. This is the work of the uh, Minister of National Defense and the Minister of Public Safety, Bill Blair. The work has already begun. By working with Quebec, 15 facilities have been identified as priorities, and two things are being done now. Re reconnaissance of these uh, establishments to understand what they need and training of uh, the Canadian Forces personnel doing this important work. And I want to add that this is work in which Quebec has the lead with strong support from the Canadian forces. There are also Red Cross volunteers that will play a very important role. In addition, we have volunteers that Health Canada has organized, and these volunteers will work with the Red Cross to do that work. Jean-Yves, do you have anything to add? Yes, very briefly. You've summarized the situation very well. Do a recall before we talk about the current situation. I think uh, April 16th, the Thursday, a request was made by the government of Quebec for the deployment of 125 members of the Canadian Forces who have medical expertise. And on the following Saturday, the members of the Canadian Forces were deployed, but that is a somewhat different context than the one we're seeing now. Now we're seeing the deployment of a larger number of members of the Canadian Forces. We're talking about a thousand. 
and people whose responsibilities and skills are not necessarily strictly medical. That's why the objective here and the prime objective focused on by the Quebec government is that this uh, deployment support the work of healthcare workers already in place and patients that are there. This personnel is not necessarily ready to deploy quickly and immediately. There is a preliminary uh, measure, which is re recognizance of the um, establishment and uh, determining responsibilities. Follow-up question? Yes. While many provinces are unveiling their uh, plans to reopen the economy, my uh, question is for Dr. New or Dr. Tam. Wouldn't this be the right time to come out for or against wearing masks if you consider this in the uh, context of de-isolation? Is it uh, compulsory to wear a non-medical mask? Yes, thank you for that question. This is Dr. New. Dr. Tam and I continue to work closely with our provincial and territorial counterparts. We had a good discussion yesterday with the Special uh, Advisory Committee on this very issue. We do agree that there are principles that have to be maintained. We may make some public health measures more flexible, but we have to keep some principles, such as physical distancing and proper uh, practices such as frequent hand washing. We have to keep that. After that, we did agree on four criteria. Each province must have good evidence that transmission in their own jurisdiction is well controlled. They have a good capacity in their health care system, in their public health system, to properly diagnose all these cases, isolated cases. They have to do tracing and so forth. We know that every province and territory have their own epidemic. They may be in different realities with regard to their epidemic curve. So it's possible that one province is starting to find that it could uh, relax its rules when others are not. And with regard to the masks, this is still an issue. We continue our discussions. We know that it is another option, a good way for people to perhaps help protect others. It's always something we consider permissive because it's not a really to protect yourself from others. But if you leave the house, perhaps it's difficult to maintain the two-meter distance, for instance, in the grocery store or in a public transit. So we continue to examine the science and probative data. Right now, that's where we are. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. New. Operator, next question, please. Thank you. The next question is from Sharon Kirky from National Post. Please go ahead. Oh, hi, Dr. Tam. You mentioned that over 700,000 Canadians have been tested with about a 7% confirmed positive, but there are concerns that the swab testing, the RT-PCR testing, has a high false negative rate because, you know, it can be tricky to get a decent sample. I'm wondering, what does your data show about the prevalence of false negatives? Um, so I think uh, the PCR tests in general actually have a good uh, specificity and quite a uh, high sensitivity in general. But I think you've just mentioned that taking a swab is not a completely simple procedure. You have to take it using the right technique at the right time, etc., to detect um, the uh, virus. And I know also that um, sometimes people need to have more than one test taken if there's uh, some degree of um, 
uh, suspicion that someone actually has the virus but was tested negative the first time will then uh, perhaps need a, a, a follow-up test as well. So I think, um, you know, absolutely this is a potential issue. Um, we do know that, of course, we do not have a full accounting of all people infected in Canada, and that is part of the work uh, that we'll be uh, doing as part of the um, immunity task force as well to actually ascertain uh, what level of infection has actually occurred in Canada. Follow up. And that was going to be yeah, that was going to be my follow up. Sorry that you know uh, the NIH and CDC have started the serological testing to try to get some kind of handle on who's been exposed and what kind of immunity levels there might be. I'm, again, I'm wondering what assumptions you're working with when thinking about what proportion of the population has already been infected. You know, is it 10 times the number of confirmed cases, 50, 100? I'm wondering what assumptions your agency is working with. Well, I think that is the, the part of the work going forwards, uh, to actually determine uh, through different methodologies um, the different areas of Canada, maybe uh, the hotspots versus the ones that didn't have uh, as much reported cases, the age group structure, um, or um, so all of that it will be part of the uh, forward. Uh, looking design. Uh, some jurisdictions are also already planning uh, these studies uh, to answer specific questions, so exactly the type of question that um, you're asking as well. We also are looking at a design that is more longitudinal because, um, so because of some of the um, serologic tests are not necessarily, again, have the high enough specificity or sensitivity and so by looking more longitudinally, even if you didn't detect something in the first time, maybe you will detect something at a later date as well. So some of all of these questions are part of the um, uh, des you know, will go into part of the design of the um, studies going forwards. Thank you, Dr. Operator. Next question, please. Thank you. The next question, la prochaine question is de Lina Dib de la Presse Canadienne. À vous la parole. Canadian Press. Question. Ms. Freeland, we get the impression over the weekend that Quebec and you did not have the same understanding of herd immunity. So I'm wondering where things stand. Do you now believe that the Legault government and you are on the same page, that they also understand? the concept of herd immunity and its usefulness right now? Answer. Because this is a scientific question, I will ask Dr. New or Dr. Tam to answer you. I'm sorry, but I don't want to have herd immunity explained to me. My question is political. That's why I'm asking you. Do you believe that under Quebec understands the same thing you do? Lina, could I ask Dr. New to answer, and then I'll be very pleased to answer on in my behalf. Thank you. This is Dr. New. Thank you for your question. I think that in the scientific community, uh, public health and health directors in all provinces and territory, and me, I've had good discussions with Dr. Arruda, and I think that from a public health perspective and scientific perspective with probative data, we don't have any conclusions right now. We know that people who have already been infected will have an antibody reaction. But the question is, we don't know whether that reaction provides immunity. And if it does, for how long? How long will that last? Is it a few weeks, a few months, maybe for life? We don't know. Because we do have evidence from other countries that people who are already infected had a second infection, were reinfected. So that's some indication that an in Infection does not give you immunity. If you're talking about herd immunity, or collective immunity, I don't think that we can use that to uh, manage this pandemic because the evidence is not there. 
right now. So we have to continue to follow the scientific evidence and data. And Dr. Arruda in Quebec, and we have had a good discussion at our special advisory committee, and everybody agrees. We have to follow science. Thank you. Okay, Nina, as I uh, promised you, I will give you a political answer now. I'm neither a scientist nor a doctor, but I do know that the federal government and all the uh, provincial premiers and territorial premiers agree that we have to follow the advice of our doctors and scientists. As uh, Dr. New just said, we have an advisory council where all directors of public health across Canada uh, talk to each other and exchange views and exchange ideas. And that's a very good thing. And I know that discussions at that level among doctors and scientists in Canada is a very collaborative collaborative and open one, they talk very often. Now, with regard to reopening, that is a very important question. On Friday, we had good discussions between the Prime Minister of Canada and the Provincial and Territorial Premiers. We're getting an agreement on the principles that will guide reopening for the whole country. And I can assure Canadians that the process will be gradual, it will be collaborative, and I know that in all of Canada, the process across this country that is so huge, so vast, the process will be guided by science. Thank you. Follow-up? Yes, thank you. My follow-up would be for Mr. Duclos. I don't quite understand why this can't be deployed more quickly, these thousand uh, military personnel. It can't be faster. Why can't it be faster? Well, let me uh, point out, it is rapid, but there are different issues compared to the first deployment where there was a smaller number of members of the Canadian Force that were called to serve, but in, they had initial skills that uh, were different. It was a uh, more restrained, restricted group. They were uh, medical technicians deployed in these long-term care facilities. So now the demand is broader, the numbers are bigger, and the number of establishments is larger, too. That's why this deployment is done differently from the first one. Thank you, Minister. Julie? In CBC, um, my first question is for Dr. Tam. Considering what the WHO said um, that you can get COVID-19, you can recover from it, and then it doesn't make you immune from getting it again. Were you surprised by that, and how much of a setback is it? Actually, I, I, I don't know that we know the full answer to that question. I think. Um, we know that people who, de who are infected with COVID-19 will develop some kind of antibody response. And that will probably provide some level of protection. We just don't know what level of protection, how strong that protection is, and how long it will last. I think that's the sort of scientific uh, discourse right now. So that's why those studies need to be done and that uh, we should be cautious about how we interpret uh, the results, for example, of some of the um, serologic testing. But I know that so many countries in the world, and now including Canada with the Immunity Task Force, we're going to try and get to the bottom of those answers. Um, but uh, right now, we just don't have enough information. Okay. So I'll just make a little comment, then I'll go to my second question. So it doesn't sound like you agree with the WHO, but now my second question. Um, and that would be for See, that's Patty. Not, that's, I don't think that's correct. No? No. I, I, I think, what, said, Dr. Tam, we don't I think know what the WHO has we said is that we don't know for sure what's happening. And I think that's what yeah, Dr. Tam Yeah, I think Tam globally we're on. including the WHO, but, you know, all the scientists around the world are just trying to gather this information. 
we can base some of the knowledge about past knowledge of infections with certain respiratory viruses, but that doesn't mean it's the same with COVID-19. So I think we're still trying to discover the answer to those questions. Um, I, I do think we expect some level of immunity, just again, how, how, how strong that is and how long it lasts is unknown. And uh, But we will get to some of these answers um, with these studies. And if I can just add, I think my interpretation of what the WHO is saying is that uh, to be careful, those countries and jurisdictions that are thinking that you could issue an immunization or an immunological passport, it was in response. I mean, look, at countries all around the world are trying to figure out a way out of this, and rightly so. And I think the warning from the WHO is exactly as Dr. Tam has said. It's far too early to be giving out any kind of certificate that says, oh, you've had COVID and therefore you are now immune, because that is a dangerous line of thinking when we haven't the science yet caught up to it, what the evidence actually says. And so it's very important, I think, to all citizens who've had COVID to know that there is a caution around assuming just because you've had it that, in fact, you are now protected. And uh, that is exactly why we have an immunity task force in Canada and many other countries are studying serological uh, prevalence so that we can understand, first of all, what the extent of, ex uh, of exposure exposure is, but also what the extent of immunity is. Both very important questions. Julie, follow up? Thank you for being so fulsome on my first question. Um, <laughs> Provoke us, <dust>, Julie. <laughs> uh, the second question is, is about testing. I'm not sure if it's for Dr. Tam or for Patty Hyde, dude, but we know that testing is very important in terms of reopening economies, and uh, we've had problems with testing in terms of lack of swabs recently in the past couple of weeks, backlog of cases in Ontario and Quebec and other provinces. I'm wondering if it's, as, if it's resolved to your satisfaction, and considering that economies are starting to talk about reopening with, you know, within the provinces very soon. I'll do a two-part answer again with uh, an overview and then turn to Dr. Tam about the conversations. Um, I think obviously Canada can do better and we've done a lot and we're very happy with the growth of testing that's happening and the capacity of provinces and territories to increase capacity of testing over the last several weeks. Part of that is uh, domestic production of some of the equipment that you've mentioned including uh, something called reagent which is essentially the the chemical, the fluid that uh, is required to complete the testing and now we have a local manufacturing source for that reagent which is making it a lot easier for um, provinces and territories to get that component of the testing done. Um, but there is more to do and, and of course I will also say that testing is one layer of a what I would call a health s safety net that we will need to be putting into place so that uh, provinces, territories and communities can in fact get back to the new normal or arrive at the new normal, if you will. Um, that testing strategy has been evolving, and we're extremely uh, encouraged by the work of the provinces and territories as they've looked for innovative ways to resolve uh, many of the challenges, some of those that you've identified. And I'll turn to Dr. Tam. Maybe you can speak a little bit about the special committee's work on testing. Yes, and it will keep uh, on undergoing evolution as we move into a next um, uh, reality, if you like. So right now, um, I think many jurisdictions are still increasing the capacity, and um, including Ontario and others, have really ramped up the testing and broadening testing, um, of course, to focus on, uh, say, long-term care homes, because systematically testing uh, all of them and much more widely um, is very, very important. So you see some of the rise in numbers as a result of those systematic uh, testing approaches. And in terms of some of the going forwards, is make sure we widen our testing uh, uh, criteria, uh, certainly to look at uh, a broad, broader um, array of sim symptoms, even mild symptoms. Uh, right now, actually, um, very few people are showing up to be tested, uh, given that we are not getting the respiratory illnesses. So I think looking at how we still broaden the net while people are actually not showing up with, with, with illnesses as well. Um, and really make sure that any outbreaks, as I said, as we descend uh, down that epidemic curve, is to be able to rapidly identify in cases, their contacts, and uh, any kind of outbreaks, particularly in vulnerable settings, where you have to actually cast the net wide in terms of testing, are some of the uh, areas 
areas for sure um, as we as we go forwards. But I think um, we are continuing to evolve the strategy right now, and it all involves actually increasing uh, capacity. And I think we're all looking to uh, plan for or eventualities. For example, what might happen next winter. So I think making sure we gear up and be prepared. Um, it is a very very um, dynamic situation and very complicated from every aspect of the sourcing of these different components of the lab testing. But I think that we're pulling out all stops, including domestic, um, you know, options. So I think uh, we're working all towards increasing lab capacity for sure. Thank you, Dr. Tonda McCharles, Chair Minister. Uh, thanks. Um, Dr. Tam, on Friday you um, talked again about the need to be extremely cautious in the reopenings. And one of the factors you talked about was your concerns around importation. Um, and I want to understand what you were talking about there and what, now that you've seen that the U.S. has nearly a third of global cases, what is your concern there and how soon do you think that that border can be reopened? So, Tan, I'll start and then I'll turn to Dr. Tam in terms of that. Um, you know, everything that we do in the next uh, phase will be done carefully and in terms of uh, the relationship with the United States and partnership with the United States. And I thank the Deputy Prime Minister and many others for their hard work on making sure those relationships stay strong and that we can have those conversations. Mm -hmm. That is part of the work that we're doing now as a government, is uh, to sort out how we do a better job when we begin to um, see an increase in travel, whether it's Canadians going abroad and then coming back, which they will always have the right to do, and how we manage those reentries carefully so that we can continue to prevent numbers of cases from arising from countries that perhaps don't have a very good handle on what's going on in their country from an infectious perspective, or that maybe have outbreaks that uh, that will create a, a health and safety concern for Canada. But I can maybe turn to Dr. Tam about some of the conversations around borders that are happening at the committee. Well, we will be extremely cautious about um, doing the, any changes to our international public health approach. Um, it is dependent on looking very carefully at the uh, what's happening in other countries, for sure. Um, but it, our sort of um, approach, though, is to make sure we get what is inside Canada uh, well managed, well controlled, and moving towards that um, uh, new living with COVID-19 um, as the primary step before we can consider uh, what we need to adjust from an international um, perspective. Um, and I noticed today uh, you haven't, in the, at least a little while ago, it, the websites hadn't been updated with the new infections picture in Canada. Yesterday, new cases seem to have picked up a bit. Um, and I am unclear on what the national picture is. Um, you say all the provinces manage their own data, but in the federal government gets that data, you are not releasing provincial data. I'd like to understand, A, what the actually, what is the national picture right now from your perspective? Have we successfully flattened the curve? Are, where are we on the curve? And um, have you asked the provinces to allow you to release their data, or are they telling you you're not, you're not allowed to release their data? So we have been publishing the national picture and updating it every day, so in, in, in terms of our website. Um, what we do want is a sort of deeper dive into more details as it pertains to the different cases that are being reported. So you will see the map of Canada, you will see the numbers uh, that are updated in real time, as well as, uh, of course, the, the tragic deaths that have been um, uh, reported as well. What we do want to get to, and I think we are improving as we go along, is the um, a, a deeper dive onto the actual um, um, knowledge of who is most severely impacted. I mean, we all know long-term care um, um, facilities and certain at-risk populations are impacted, but we do need more granular data on some of that, for sure. I think that, interestingly, from, from, from my perspective, it is, I, I would say, part of the Stronger Together theme, actually, when I was thinking about it, is that F, from a public health and chief medical perspective, partnership is strong. But 
we have to invest in our public health capacities and infrastructure and how we do um, data um, collection and sharing in a way that is more efficient for the front line who are busy trying to work on all sorts of things while still getting the national uh, data that we need. So I think um, there's a lot of room for uh, moving forwards to really enhance that. And I certainly hope that, you know, as we get through um, this pandemic together, we don't forget public health and the need for public health and what that capacity requirement is to provide um, something as what people think is simple, which is data. Data comes from many different sources, from healthcare, from labs, from public health. All of these are important. They need to come together. And uh, we need to look at the most efficient way uh, that we can do that. And, and it is an area that we need to address. Um, but, um, you know, we, uh, we do have dif a differential picture going on across the country with some provinces that do not have community transmission that has managed not to have it, some that have had some community transmission and that are getting addressed. But of course, the four biggest provinces where uh, most of the cases are coming from had a slightly different stage in the epidemiology, and they've been reporting out on that as well. So that does impact uh, some of the details and the planning of that next phase. And you will hear the sort of details from each of the individual provinces as well. We, at the Special Advisory Committee level, is looking at a, a broader set of criteria of how jurisdictions could go about moving into that next phase. Thank you, Dr. Mike. Thank you. Uh, Wood Buffalo has asked for military to assist, assist in evacuations because of flooding and stuff. Um, will the military be made available to help with this situation? Uh, thanks for the question, Mike. And we are aware of the flooding in Fort McMurray uh, and are looking right now very urgently at ways that we can help. Um, as we have known from the outset, the fact that flooding season and in due course forest fire season is coinciding with coronavirus in Canada is posing some special challenges. We have been gearing up for those from the outset, and this is an issue that we are looking at urgently today. Okay, could you help okay, me understand? Okay, we're gonna pull away from this uh, federal briefing. That was the Deputy Prime Minister, Christia Freeland, responding to uh, a question about military support uh, in Alberta, where forest fire season has started in Fort McMurray and, and other communities around it, and they are asking for military support that will come. Uh, at the same press conference, we did get a sense of the military support that is heading into Quebec. 15 long-term care facilities have now been targeted or selected as particular crisis points for Quebec and the military will be sent into those 15 facilities to help out in different capacities. Uh, as we come to the end of our coverage today, I'll bring back Vashi Capellas and the CBC's David Cochran. And Vashi, I'll start with you. A couple of things, I think, picking up where the Prime Minister left off, we heard a lot from Dr. Tam as well as the Health Minister on this concept of reopening the economy and what markers different provinces or different parts of society basically have to hit for that reopening process, or as David put it, maybe not just the economy, but society as a whole to take part, or to, to take place, rather. And I thought the comments around testing, and particularly what we heard from the WHO this weekend, in which they first kind of said there's no, or they did say, there's no evidence that this serological testing, so testing once you've been, once you, to, to show you've already have it, mm -hmm. is actually working. And then they had to backtrack and say, well, we think that it likely, you, you likely are immune, but we just don't know for sure. That is true, we don't have a ton of evidence there are instances, for example, where you have the antibodies, but you're not necessarily immune. That's what the task force is looking at. Dr. Naylor talked about that last week. But it does sort of bring up how complicated it might be to figure yeah. out what is safe to reopen. Yeah. How safe is it? And also the last comment from Dr. Tam about how those provinces that have more cases are at a different point on the curve than many provinces that we have 
seen flatten the curve where there is a far you know fewer instances for example of community transmission so very regional differences as we've been saying for weeks yeah and, and and I thought it was interesting too and David you can pick up uh, on on the testing criteria the fact that uh, Dr. Tam said we are going to need to broaden the criteria because there's lots of people showing up who don't have respiratory problems who have other kinds of symptoms so that also complicates things if you don't even really know what you're looking for at that point hard to find out exactly what kind of picture you have in the country overall David I, I think the common thread and a lot of the answers to the questions about when can we reopen and what about serological testing and what about this and what about herd immunity is just how little is known about That's this right. virus COVID-19 yeah. it's called a novel coronavirus because it's brand new and there's just even though it is in every country in the world the body of evidence scientific evidence and data on which to make these firm pronouncements or conclusions it just isn't there and it's not going to be there for a while. There's a lot of various laboratory testing and vaccine developments and, 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 and scientific experiments going on to find out more about it. And, and quite frankly, Canada is not at a point where it has broad based testing uh, to draw any firm conclusions. So it's only recently Ontario has broadly expanded its testing mm -hmm. to encompass everybody in a long term care home. And I think we all know that is where the singular crisis is in this country. It's in those long term care and group home settings with vulnerable populations. So until that gets under control, the sort of level of certainty we're going to need to make big decisions uh, is just not going to be there until testing ha has expanded and the science has evolved. Okay, thank you both very much for uh, all your help with the coverage. Vashi Capellas, you can see her on her show, Power and Politics at 5 Eastern. And David, you'll find him in various locations, I'm sure, through the day. <laughs> thank you both very much. Yeah. I appreciate it. Uh, and I'll just wrap up our coverage here, just reminding you that the primary focus from the government perspective today is on the wage subsidy program. It is now open. The Prime Minister says that 10,000 companies have applied so far for 75% subsidy of wages. So that online and available to companies everywhere, another part of the government's economic response to COVID-19. And on that, uh, I will leave our coverage knowing that we are going to be looking forward now within the next hour to the coverage of Ontario Premier Doug Ford and his plan to reopen Ontario. Andrew, over to you. All right, Rosie, thank you. And lots to get to, including that plan on reopening Ontario. That is being released in half an hour from now at 1.30 uh, Eastern time. We will